Hi there, it's Kate here from the Safeguarding Academy and welcome to this evening's Safeguarding Briefing. Tonight we're going to be taking a look at some of the changes that happened in 2017 as well as taking a view on what may happen in 2018, some of the anticipated changes and reflecting on some of the things that have hit the press recently and how they might impact the world of child protection as we move through the rest of 2018. For those of you who don't know me, hi, I'm Kate Young and I run the Safeguarding Academy. Some of you may have seen my YouTube channel, some of you have may have been reading some of my blogs. Um, to those of you who don't know me, hello and you are very, very welcome to this webinar. My background is as a child protection lawyer and I still practice as a locum solicitor for a number of local authorities up and down the country. I am also the independent chair of a safeguarding board in the Kent area and I work really closely with universities and youth outreach teams in terms of training their mentors, their safeguarding and welfare staff to help them understand some of the issues that are affecting their students and also to make them aware of some of the issues that they may come up against when they're working with schools and those who are under the age of 18. My baby is the online Safeguarding Academy which can be found at thesafeguardingacademy.com. That is a hub for child protection professionals. I know, working on my own in this office, how lonely it can be and how difficult sometimes it can be to work out what you need to do next or to, to understand how you maybe need to make a change because of something that has happened. And sometimes, let's be honest, we just need to talk to somebody else who knows what on earth is going on. Because let's face it, there's nothing really quite like the world of child protection for all its quirks and stresses and strains as well. And so that's what the Online Academy does. It provides a safe space for members to share good practice, to ask for help and to share good ideas. There's no shame in asking for help at all. Sometimes that's absolutely what we have to do. It also gives members monthly trainings on a variety of topics. I'll be honest, it's mostly stuff that I'm really interested in. And so we have independent experts come and share their learning and their knowledge with us so that we can all learn from them as well. So you can find out more about the Online Safeguarding Academy at www.thesafeguardingacademy.com forward slash online dash academy. OK. That's enough about me. Let us crack on with the view in reverse. So what happened in 2017? For me, 2017 wasn't a massive year, but there were some big things that happened in terms of some clarity and also around where 2018 may go next. So the big thing that happened, it was a year ago, February 2017, was we finally got a definition, a standard definition of child sexual exploitation. You may recall, or you probably will recall, that up until February 2017, there were about five different definitions. In fact, it seemed to change depending on which organisation you were talking to. Sometimes the government had one definition, the NSPCC had something else, different LSCBs had something else as well. And frankly, from a, from a lawyer's perspective, it was just utterly confusing. From a practitioner's perspective, it was equally confusing, trying to work out which definition fitted where and for what purpose. So in February 2017, finally, the government released an updated document setting out its definition of child sexual exploitation. And the definition is this. Child sexual exploitation is a form of child sexual abuse. It occurs where there is an, where an individual or group takes advantage of an imbalance of power to coerce, manipulate or deceive a child or young person under the age of 18 
into sexual activity A, in exchange for something the victim needs or wants and or B, for the financial advantage or increased status of the perpetrator or facilitator. The victim may have been sexually exploited even if the sexual activity appears consensual. Child sexual exploitation does not always involve physical contact. It can also occur through the use of technology. So that's the definition that we're all now working towards. There are a number of challenges ahead in relation to that. Uh, there are ongoing cases around child sexual exploitation. Rotherham is still struggling with the number of child sexual exploitation cases it is handling. And the latest news I read was that in order to deal with the inquiry, the um, the inquiry needs about another 100 officers to cope with the number of disclosures and the amount of work that's been generated by the CSE abuse scandal that's happened within Rotherham. Let's be absolutely honest here. There is unlikely to be an area of the country that isn't affected by child sexual exploitation. In my home city of, of Kingston upon Hull, I'm well aware that there is a growing issue around child sexual exploitation. I'm also increasingly aware of the absolutely fantastic work that is going on locally with a number of organisations, government, charitable, private, that is all aimed towards helping those who are victims of child sexual exploitation and to build and generate awareness of the issue around the city. The stuff that's happening is fantastic. I just wish it was shared more broadly, but I'm aware that the the police, the health service, the fire service, the Coast Guard, the army, um, the private sector, local government, social services are all joining forces in an absolutely amazing way in order to make sure that children in this area are being protected. And I have no doubt that within your area, there will be something going on that is equally fantastic. So if there is, please leave a comment and share it because I'd love to know what initiatives are happening around the country in terms of child sexual exploitation and how this issue is being tackled. At the, the conference we held um, in October of last year, the theme unintentionally became that of child sexual exploitation and we heard fantastic talks from the likes of Zoe Lodrick and there is an amazing play doing the rounds called Invisible and it's run by the Footlights UK Theatre Company. It's doing a tour of schools. If you want to see it, please do. It is one of the most powerful plays I have ever seen and they are doing absolutely amazing work around the northwest, the northeast, in fact nationally, in order to get this message out. It's based on the Rochdale and Rotherham serious case reviews, so it's all rooted in fact and reality. It's absolutely worth a watch if you get chance to see it. So I do urge you to, to look at that for your own CPD, if nothing else. And it's brilliant for the school. Year 9s, year 10s, year 11s get it. They absolutely get it because it talks their language. OK, so that was the big thing for me in 2017. Child sexual exploitation definition. We've got proper, well thought out, um, consensual definition of what we mean when we say child sexual exploitation. Remember that there isn't one single criminal act that takes place when we talk about child sexual exploitation. It's made up of a number of acts of pieces of legislation that go into um, being able to prosecute somebody for the various elements of child sexual exploitation. So it's not a single criminal act. There are lots of different things that go on and that will make up the issue of child sexual exploitation as well. Okay. Towards the back end of 2017, 
we had two big consultations open up. You remember back in uh, 2016, there was a big consultation around keeping children safe in education and the revised version and updated version of keeping children safe in education came out in September 2016. And that's the version that we're all working towards. Even if you're not in education, this document is a really, really good starting point when you're working with children and young people. It's a really great place to start and to really hone the skills that you have um, and to, to really look at the sorts of issues that are coming up around child sexual exploit uh, around child sexual exploitation around keeping children safe in education and the whole myriad of issues that can go on within the education sector in fact within the world of child protection as we'll come on to in a moment there's lots of good guidance in there around safer recruitment around keeping staff trained lots of really good practice elements to work from so if you're not just if you're not in education and thinking well, that doesn't really apply to me have a look there will be bits in there that you can use as a basis for good practice for your organization i have no doubt about that whatsoever that document has been up for review again there's a consultation that's just finished around child um, keeping children safe in education I anticipate that we'll get the outcome of that probably towards the start of the uh, the new school year, September time. By the time it's been through the consultation process, it's then been revised and you've got the various agencies working in with the whole um, revision of keeping children safe in education. So watch out for that later on this year. Um, Academy members, you'll be getting updating training on this as and when it's uh, released so don't worry about that you will have access to that from me but in terms of keeping children safe in education keep an eye on that the press will be filled with it in terms of the child protection press in the early years and the the education press so if you're not part of that world you're not within the education sector but want to know what's happening make sure on my mailing list and then you'll you'll get a notification as to when that has been published the other document that's out for consultation, and as that consultation's also ended actually, is the Working Together to Safeguard Children document. You'll recall that last year there was a um, big piece of legislation came out. And that's the Social Work Bill, the, the Children and Social Work Bill, which part of the Working Together to Safeguard Children consultation is around the role of the social worker and the responsibilities that are to be potentially placed on their shoulders in individual cases. For those of you who work within the world of child protection, um, particularly closely with local authorities, so I'm thinking the education sector predominantly, um, maybe even health and in some cases the police, then you'll be aware that the local authority doesn't make a decision based on one person say so. It's a corporate, it's a, it's a body, it's an entity. And whether the ultimate decision is that which accords with the recommendation of the social worker dealing on the ground is a matter of uh, scrutiny for senior managers and in some cases directors of children's services depending on what is happening and that's the way it's been um, for a long time so that no one social worker can be held solely responsible for the decision making of the local authority it also protects local authorities from basically being bound by decisions of social workers that could leave it financially vulnerable, may not actually be in the best interest of the child, and in some cases may not even be a service that the local authority is even able to offer. That may change subject to the decision making that happens following this consultation. So if you work within those sectors, particularly if you work within social work, make sure that you know 
what is happening. I'm fairly certain there will be releases from Coram Bath. There'll be releases around um, updates from uh, HCPC as well. So be aware of that. And let's just see what happens once the, um, the, the Working Together document comes out. The other big thing that happens out of this Working Together consultation is the transition from local safeguarding children's boards to safeguarding partnerships. See, having said 2017 was quite quiet, actually, it was quite big with that piece of legislation. There is a bit of doubt within uh, various safeguarding communities about what change will actually happen when the transition happens. The one school of thought is that the safeguarding partnerships change will mean that there's better working together, that there is more openness, there's less blame pointed where there's been a serious case review. And there's also the issue of what happens where there's been a child death in terms of child death reviews happening. So on the one hand, there is a school of thought that says this is going to be a really positive change. There's going to be lots of change happen and things are going to be very, very different. On the other hand, there is a school of thought that says nothing is actually going to change on the ground. It's simply going to be a rebrand of local safeguarding children's boards and it isn't really going to make that much difference. I don't know. The, the honest answer is, I, I don't know. I would like to see a little from column A and a little from column B because there's an awful lot of stuff that local safeguarding children's boards do, which is really, really good. There are some things that probably do need to change, some things that maybe do need to be reflected upon and amended. But how that happens and what the change actually is, we will have to wait and see uh, until the uh, transition guidance comes out, which I think that's expected in May of this year. So keep an eye on that. I know some LSCBs are trying to get ahead of the curve a bit and make changes where they're anticipating changes to be. Others are simply waiting for the guidance to come out and are hanging fire really to see what on earth they are asked to do and how they manage to do it. Right then. Where are we now? So we've got some anticipated changes coming in terms of keeping children safe in education and the working together to safeguard children. You would have to have probably been on a different planet in the last few weeks to not have heard about the scandal which has rocked the aid sector. Massive charities like Oxfam and Save the Children have been affected by allegations of abuse caused by their aid workers in foreign territories. This has raised a number of questions around recruitment, the role of safeguarding within these organisations and how these organisations keep the most vulnerable that they are essentially charged with caring for safe. This has been a discussion around, um, sorry, within the regular safeguarding hour I run on Twitter and conversations on there have stretched from we're probably going to see an entire shake-up of the recruitment of uh, people who work with children and young people through to nothing's really going to happen. I anticipate there are likely to be guidelines released around how uh, aid workers are recruited, what happens with volunteers, how you do DBS checks and really around some due diligence when taking on um, members of staff to deal with an, at high level positions who are working directly with vulnerable young people. Those guidelines may well have implications as the Keeping Children Safe in Education document is being reviewed. Ah, the joys of technology. So what I was saying is, given the changes that we're anticipating within Keeping Children Safe in Education around safer recruitment, 
this may well be informed by anything that comes out of an inquiry and any inquiry or um, perhaps change in practice thought of by way of government for um, the aid sector. But given this is an international issue, I don't anticipate that we'll get a response particularly quickly. It may be that this is a change that happens later down the line, probably not in 2018. Although, keep an eye out because there may well be guidance issued by some of the other bodies around some of the safer recruitment issues that have been arising because of what has happened within the aid sector. The final point I want to talk about is that of taxi drivers. You'll recall that taxi drivers were mentioned as part of the Rotherham scandal, part of the um, CSE intervention that was going on and is still continuing. There are questions being asked around whether or not there need to be tighter safeguards in place for the uh, driving that the taxi driver industry they are already one of the most heavily regulated areas and I'm aware that as part of the tendering process for taxi drivers or taxi firms to obtain work for local authorities they have to undergo a number of uh, checks for their drivers it may well be that there are going to be some further uh, checks balances measures guidelines regulations put in place around taxi drivers as well particularly around their personal history and their maybe family connections as well whilst this may not directly affect you it is probably will affect the wider safeguarding world. Anybody that uses a taxi, anybody that puts their children in taxis to go to sports events or clubs or back from school, um, particularly thinking where there are taxis to transport vulnerable young adults to and from sessions, there may well be some uh, further guidance around that best practice is be vigilant if you aren't going through a local authority um, for your taxi service i.e you haven't gone with the local authority and tendered with them or been part of that tender for them to provide taxis then it's best practice to do your own due diligence in the same way you would do when recruiting a new member of staff Make sure that you've done the checks that you need to do to be as protected as possible. I don't know what the future holds in relation to, to taxis. It is a an emerging area at the moment, one to keep an eye on and to see what happens at some point in the future with that. So it's over to you now. I'd love you to leave a comment below with some of the changes that or some of the potential updates that you anticipate are going to happen, particularly within your world. Maybe you're in the world of sport. Are you expecting some of Dr. Tanny Gray, um, some of Tanny Gray Thompson's recommendations to be put into place? I remember she wrote the report that came out last year looking at one of some of the key areas around safeguarding in sport and recommendations for coaches. Do you have any thoughts on what's going to happen as a result of the CSE definition? Anything that you think is going to happen as a result of the consultation around working together and the Keeping Children Safe in Education documentation? And maybe there's something happening in your area that's particularly pertinent to you Maybe not so for the rest of the country, but I'd love to know. Leave a comment below and tell us what's happening. Let's really share what best practice looks at and what's happening up and down the country in terms of changes and challenges to our practice and particularly to those that we work to protect our young people. So thank you very much. I'm Kate from the Safeguarding Academy and you can 
Find out more about me and the Academy at www.thesafeguardingacademy.com. Thank you so much for listening and any questions or queries, leave a comment below because I will be reading them all. Many thanks.